The report is prepared by federal scientists, and it says the annual average temperature over land is increased by 1.7 degrees Celsius since 1948. Now, in the north, the story is even worse. The increase even higher, at 2.3 degrees. That compared to the average global temperature that's up by slightly less than one degree, 0 0.8 degrees. The report shows an increase in precipitation and flooding in many parts of the country, but also says there's a higher risk of heat waves, drought and wildfires, and even a risk to fresh water availability. The report also makes a crucial point about the main cause of climate change. It says, while both human activities and natural variations in the climate have contributed to the observed warming in Canada, the human factor is dominant. It is likely that more than half of the observed warming in Canada is due to the influence of human activities. The report goes on to say the largest uncertainty about the magnitude of future climate change is rooted in uncertainty about human behavior. David Miller joins me here in Toronto. He is an ambassador for inclusive climate action at C40 and the former head of the World Wildlife Fund in Canada. He was also mayor of Toronto at one point. David, welcome to you. Uh, thanks for having me on, Carol. What's your reaction to the numbers in this report that were actually double the global rate? Well, it's grim, it's serious. If you've been involved with this issue for a long time, as I have, it's sadly not a surprise. Uh, the report clearly demonstrates the need for action in Canada and, of course, comes at a time that uh, a number of politicians from the Conservative Party are fighting very much against any action at all. And I, I think is really a testament to the need not just for the federal government, but provinces and, of course, cities uh, to act as well. Well, let's talk about the implications of this. Uh, what does it mean for the environment when you're looking at a warming rate two times the rest of the world? Well, it's extremely serious. Um, you know, for example, if you speak to Inuit people in the Arctic, they will tell you that they're seeing things like birds that they don't have names for because they've never been there. And if you think about the broader implications of different migratory patterns for animals, and for insects, you uh, all of a sudden realize that things like crops and the kind of crops that can properly pollinate are very much at risk. This report, ironically, because uh, Saskatchewan under its government has refused to act on climate, demonstrates that in the heartland of Canada and Saskatchewan in particular, there are very serious risks going forward mm -hmm. to the ability to grow crops. Um, and there are serious implications in every part of the country. And I think what it says is we need to take the threat extremely seriously and uh, uh, call for national action from all parts of government and from all people. In the north, it's even worse. The average, average temperature beyond double, uh, increasing by 2.3 percent. And there's, yes, and there's serious implications there. Uh, for example, with permafrost with places that are reachable in the winter by ice roads. With respect to infrastructure that's built on permafrost, and if the per permafrost melts, what will happen? Extremely serious implications, but it's not just the north. In the water chapter in the report, it specifically talks about the risk of significantly increased urban flooding. We've already seen in this country uh, climate-related risks, whether it's the wildfires in BC, which are at least partly attributable uh, to climate change, uh, whether it's floods in Calgary or Toronto, the massive, massive costs of dealing with these consequences, that speaks to the importance to act. And it's not just a cost issue, of course. It's very, very severe risk of dislocation for uh, human beings across Canada. Yeah, we'll see more rainfall in Canada over the 21st century, as you yes. say. Our temperatures getting hotter, our cold temperatures becoming less cold. And the reason behind this, the dominant reason, the report says, is the building up of atmospheric greenhouse gases, principally CO2. Who is driving that buildup in Canada? How does it get fixed? Well, how it gets fixed it is actually really clear to me. I, as you mentioned in the introduction, I work for the C40 Climate Leadership Group, which is a group of the world's leading mayors, uh, 94 of them at the moment, of uh, the largest cities in the world, cities like uh, Shenzhen, China, Beijing, Paris, London, Los Angeles, Toronto, Montreal and Vancouver in Canada. And they're working very hard on real actions to address climate change. 
And yes, the federal government has introduced a carbon tax in provinces that aren't acting, and of course, uh, that's something that's a necessary tool, but it's not sufficient. And what we see in the leading cities are efforts to electrify transportation, efforts to have far more public transportation for that matter, efforts to ensure that buildings are built to the highest standards of efficiency and old buildings uh, are made to be to modern standards. These efforts could go national and make a huge difference. The City of Toronto, for example, greenhouse gases today are 33 percent below 1990 levels because the province of Ontario co closed the Lakeview coal-fired plant and because of a whole range of efforts the City of Toronto did around transportation, uh, how we heat and cool buildings, how we ma and how we manage our waste. Those things could spread across the country and what we need to see is the federal government and provincial governments supporting those kinds of actions and ensuring that we do much more of preventing the greenhouse gas emissions through burning fossil fuels which are often wasted uh, in inefficient buildings and inefficient transportation systems. All right. Well, David Miller, I, 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 I'm going to ask you for a quick answer to this question. What are the chances? Give me a percentage. What are the chances you think that the current political climate will allow for everyone to get behind one purpose? Well, we've just heard a half an hour on the latest uh, discussions about a scandal on Parliament Hill, and you know we've had about eight minutes on climate change. Uh, I hope Canadians speak up because as they start to see the changes affecting them, they're going to demand action. And if Canadians speak up, their politicians will listen and will start to see real action because the actions are available now. We know what to do. It's a matter of doing it. Okay, this is the first eight minutes, but I think there are more minutes to come on the CBC. I'm going to Let, bet on that. Let's hope. Okay, David Miller is the ambassador for inclusive climate change, climate action at C40, and former head of the World Wildlife Fund Canada. Canada's climate is warming at twice the rate as other countries. This according to a new report that is out today. On average, global warming rates sit at around 0 .0, excuse me, 0 0.8 degrees Celsius since 1948. Now for Canada, the annual average temperature over land has warmed 1.7 degrees Celsius in that time frame. And that figure balloons for the north where temperatures have risen 2.3 degrees. Well, for more, we're reaching out right now to Catherine McKenna, she being the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. She joins us right now in Ottawa. Minister, thank you for joining us once again. Hi, Michael. So listen, uh, some disturbing numbers, as we say, in this new report. So talk to us about what you find most striking in its findings. Well, I mean, I don't know that this report is, is a surprise in the sense that we had a UN report last year that talked about um, the rate of warming, and we've been seeing the impacts across the country. I know Canadians I talk to are concerned about the forest fires we've seen in British Columbia, the floods, the droughts, the extreme heat that literally killed people in Ontario and Quebec last summer. And so it's just a reminder how important it is that we act, that we transition to a cleaner future. Um, and when you look at the projections, I mean, it just says, it says that there's going to be more flooding. So not, not just if you live by the ocean, but also if you, you know, live by lakes or rivers, that we're going to see more forest fires. Um, we're going to see more extreme heat. And that, and all of these, like all of these impacts, they disproportionately impact vulnerable people. If you're a senior, um, lower income, uh, if you're young. And so we need to be really figuring out what we, we need to do to tackle climate change in Canada, but also internationally. And that's why we have a climate plan. And that's why we're working so hard yesterday. Uh, no longer free to pollute anywhere in the country um, and in the provinces where there's a price on pollution because the provincial government didn't act. We're giving the money back. So we're taking measures that are practical, um, but that also ensure that life's affordable for folks. But let me pick up on that point, though, because a uh, part of this report also seems to indicate that these, these changes are not reversible. So to those that uh, you mentioned your own climate plan, to those that are uh, balking at the carbon tax imposed in New Brunswick, Ontario, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, there are people that say this increase in tax is not going to do anything to save the environment. Again, this report says the changes are irreversible. So what do you say to the critics of your climate plan, given that one line of this report? Well, I mean, the, the reality is if we don't act, we're going to see even more severe impacts. Of course, we need to adapt to the impacts of climate change. That's why we're working with cities, with provinces, uh, with businesses, with individuals to make sure our communities are more resilient. But if we don't act now, we're going to see even greater impacts. And so I think it's just a reminder 
that one, we're feeling the impacts now, but the longer term projections um, under a high emission scenario are very severe. And we don't have to be in the high emission scenario. We can take action now. We know what the problem is. We've got too much pollution and we know what the solutions are. Putting a price on pollution so it's no longer free to pollute is one of them. But also making historic investments in public transportation, energy efficiency, where we help uh, businesses, schools, hospitals, cities, individuals be more energy efficient in their homes, um, in their transportation. Um, we just announced a, an incentive for zero emission vehicles, $5,000, um, to help reduce emissions, but also helps folks save money. Investing in clean solutions, phasing out coal, investing in renewables. You have to take an across the board approach. Um, but I think this just confirms that we need to be serious and so I hope that you know quite frankly conservative politicians premiers um, of the four provinces that are fighting a price on pollution Andrew Scheer um, who has no climate plan that they look at this report and then they think about how important it is that we all come together to act to protect the only planet we have what we value in our country um, because we owe it we owe it to future generations but should it be in the form of an individual tax because people right now are complaining the fact that they are going to be paying uh, more for gasoline, especially in the four provinces where a carbon tax was imposed yesterday. Uh, people in more rural areas are expressing greater fear and concern about that because for them, the investments, for example, that you make in public transit out of this carbon tax is not going to help them as they are in more remote areas where public transit is not an option, but it is going to come out of their own pockets. Andrew Shear said it himself on the weekend that this tax is going to hurt those whose uh, incomes have not really raised in real terms in about a generation? Uh, well, I mean, that's why we have said that we need to be putting a price on pollution, but in a way that makes life affordable. For So 80% um, of people will be better off and that disproportionately supports people who are lower uh, middle income um, and it creates the incentive to save more money and that there are other solutions out there but we've recognized folks in rural areas could be you know they may not have as many options that's why we've got a 10 percent top up and look, this is what we're going to continue to do. We're going to continue to have practical solutions that are demonstrated to work. Um, we have solutions that show, you know, in, if you look at uh, British Columbia, they've had a price on pollution for a decade. They've reduced their emissions, um, their economy, one of the fastest growing in the country, and they have a vibrant clean tech sector creating good jobs. And it's just, it's not just the negative side of climate change, which of course we're seeing the impacts and paying the costs right now, $2 billion per year in insured costs going up, you know, exponentially, but it's also the economic opportunity. And the, the countries that figure it out, the provinces, the businesses that have the clean solutions, they're the ones who are going to create good jobs. Uh, we're going to be able to export those solutions and position us, ourselves well for the future. Okay, well, uh, let's uh, keep tracking that story. But you know, I have to ask you this next question as this is all the talk right now in Ottawa, and that has to do with Jody Wilson Raybould. Uh, members of your own caucus uh, becoming more and more vocal that they believe that she needs to leave caucus given the recording, given the fact that she's not willing to publicly support the Prime Minister. Uh, what do you say? Is it time for Jody Wilson Raybould to leave the caucus? Um, look, this situation is unfortunate, and I think there are lessons learned from SNC Lavalin about the role of the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. I mean, I will say I was very disappointed to hear about a recording. I'm a lawyer, so there are ethical issues raised with a recording where the other person doesn't know that it's being recorded. And I don't understand why you wouldn't just, if you're really concerned about what was said, you wouldn't march that recording off right to the Prime Minister right then. But look, you know, I think we really need to move on. Uh, we have huge issues. Um, we need to be talking about climate change. We need to be talking about these solutions. I think there's going to be a good discussion in caucus. I'm just one voice. Uh, I go there as uh, a member of parliament, a, a liberal member. And uh, I think, you know, we need to figure out, you know, what we're going to do in this situation. But also we need to figure out how we're continuing to deliver for Canadians. Because when I knock on doors and I go every single week, Canadians are worried about climate change. They're worried about growing the economy. They're worried yet, about jobs. And yet as this snc Lavalin controversy goes on, the discussion is still very much on Jody Wilson-Raybould. And here she is being asked yesterday as she was leaving Parliament Hill whether or not she supported the Prime Minister. She did not answer that question. Can she stay in caucus, in your opinion, without publicly supporting Justin Trudeau? Um, I think if you're in caucus, you're saying that you have confidence and trust in your members of the caucus. You have confidence and trust or are going to be focused on the liberal agenda, which includes tackling climate change. And it means you've got confidence and trust in the prime minister.
Catherine McKenna, thank you.